Hutt. The date is November 22nd, and we are talking today to Frank Bogart, Mayor of Palm Springs, for the Palm Springs Public Library's Prickly Pears, A Historic Portrait of Palm Springs. Uh, again, talking to Frank Bogart, uh, I, I think initially I'd like to ask you a little bit about your family, where you came from, and uh, then maybe we can get on into when you came to Palm Springs. Well, my family, I came from Colorado, Mesa, Colorado. My father had a cattle ranch up on top of the Grand Mesa, and he used to run cattle down into uh, Utah, down by Cisco, Utah. And uh, he used to run 25,000 head of cattle up in that country. That was open range in Utah in those days. And uh, after the panic of 1907 and uh, the banks all going broke and the cattle business went to hell, the old man sold the ranch and we moved down to Palisade and we had a um, um, peach orchard there and the old man had a Maxwell agency. And then we went to Grand Junction and North, that's where I went to high school and then I came to, uh, we came out here in um, 1921 to Los Angeles and I went to school. We are, there were eight kids in my family. I'm the youngest of eight. And um, then I came down here first in um, 1927, just the year I entered UCLA. What brought you down to this area? Well, I had a, I was in partners with a guy named Rod Abbott, and we had a stable. I used to work every summer when I was a kid up in the mountains up at Wrightwood. And uh, when we got, um, every year we'd, pick, we'd work all summer and we'd uh, put the horses in pasture all winter. And it finally got so it was expensive, uh, 100 horses at $3 a month all summer, so we were looking for some place to go in the winter. And so we came down to Palm Springs in 1927 and set up a stable. Uh, right on section 14, in those days you just uh, walked in and uh, put up a tack room and a hitch and rack and started in business. It wasn't any problem. There were nine stables in those days. There were that many here at that yeah, time? Yeah, they were all over town. And uh, then uh, after that, we went to uh, um, Smoke Tree. Well, in 1926, I came down here for a little while and worked with the guy that we had the first horses at Deepwell. And then after a couple of years of being on Section 14 with Rod Abbott, we got the stable at Smoke Tree. Um, an old guy named Prebstel had it, and we bought him out and um, had the stables right on the highway in those days, about where the um, Smoke Tree market and everything is in there today. Uh, Norman Farah, you mentioned him. Is that correct? Um, bad well, pronunciation. Norm, Norman, didn't, Norman had. Um, he was an old guy that had a stable uh, here in town, and he got started by um, Harriet Cody, had horses at the entrance to Tokwitz Canyon. And she went to Europe and left Norman, he was a kind of a cowboy guy, and uh, left her horses with Norman. And when she came back, he had started his own stable with her horses and oh, really? had a pretty good thing going. And he um, bought the land on uh, Techiba. It was uh, right next to Stevens Golf Course there. The old El Mirador Golf Course was in the back end of it. And uh, it's still there, the blank piece of land in there. And uh, Norman had, uh, he had the biggest stable in town and did a lot of picture work. Whenever a picture would come down here, he had enough horses to do it. And he had carriages and stage coaches. That old coach that used to drive around town that I sold to um, um, Frank, uh, I mean uh, Chuck Kaufman, he still got it over at his house, was one of the old uh, Brewster coaches he had. And he had uh, oh, buckboards and phaetons and all kinds of wagons. He had a couple of chariots. And that's what we used in our first chariot race we had in the Desert Circus. And after it was um, 1934, Norm went bankrupt and uh, I was assigned by the bank to take over his stable. And uh, that was kind of an interesting thing. It would take a long time to tell it, but Norman uh, 
went crazy. And he thought he was Jesus Christ and he put on long bathrobes and uh, uh, did all kinds of weird things. He got on, his, got on a burrow and rode out into the desert with a long white bathrobe on. And uh, he thought he was Jesus Christ going out into the desert. And when he came back, he said, you know, I've been down to the Salton Sea and it's just like the Sea of Galilee. And he said, everything here is just like Jesus. He says, I'm the second coming of Christ. So we finally got him in a uh, booby hatch and then sold all the horses and, and all his equipment. And uh, Zaddy Bunker bought the stable. Now this was the one on Section 14? No, that was the one on uh, Tachiba. Oh, okay. okay. And Earl Streeby still lives there. It's, uh, there's about seven acres in there. We had uh, the uh, stable, was a big old adobe uh, stable. And uh, it, was the, it was built for the Bengal Lancers when they made the Bengal Lancers down here. And uh, they tore it all down after a while. And there were some, there were four Hogans, we call them. They were made like Navajo Hogans. They were round, and that's where all the cowboys lived in the four Hogans. We had about uh, nine or ten cowboys there all the time. And uh, there, was, there was enough business here as far as tourists and all in the movie industry to well, support that many stables? Oh, yeah. Well, in those days, there wasn't much else to do. You know, everybody that came down here would ride a horse up the canyons or s something. Can we show the stables after? Well, what, when Norm came back, then after he got out of Norman Farr, after he got out of uh, the booby hatch, when we had an auction, he was sitting there and he had a uh, 45 in his pocket, and uh, he was bidding on all the horses and everything. <laughs> and Every time they'd bid a horse or sell it, why, his face would get all red and he'd reach for his gun. And I was sitting right by, back of him with a big shillelagh. I was going to bop him on the head if he <laughs> pulled his gun. But uh, we finally sold it and everything. And Zaddy bought the uh, stable and Trav Rogers bought uh, a lot of the horses. Then Trav took over that stable on Tachiva. And then later he built a new stable, which was the one way out uh, on uh, Sunrise, you know, where... Warren Coble bought it from him after that, okay. but um, the Warren, well, there were a lot of people in between him and Warren Coble, the ranch club, they called it, you know. But you know what's, what's interesting is, uh, to get back to the old time when we had uh, a lot of stables down here, Cliff Freger had the stable that was on Ramon, that was a desert inn stable, and then um, Trav had the stable there that kind of catered to El Mirador. And then there were two or three other stables that were in on um, Caballeros, and uh, like Lane Sykes and uh, a couple other old guys that had stables in there. Old Tex, you remember Tex, what his name was? It had a great big little ranch in there. Anyway, uh, um, and then uh, after that, uh, Rod and I sold out to a guy uh, that had the smoke tree stable. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so there were stables at Smoke Tree, and uh, the Deepwell Ranch had a stable, and then there was a stable on the Cliff Fregers, and then a couple on the reservation. And was that one at, at, at Ramon and Sunrise? Is that the one that catered to the the Desert Inn? It was uh, up up from Sunrise a little bit, okay. and uh, the um, but the interesting thing is that uh, in in the early days, cowboys all were very part of the social life of Palm Springs. And uh, I used to go, for instance, every night I'd go to El Mirador promoting uh, horseback rides and Cliff Freger, he'd get all dressed up and go up to the Desert Inn and promote rides. And every party you'd go to, would be there'd always be a lot of the local cowboys there, you know. And a lot of these old boys were really good old time cowboys. You know, they're cowboys that come out here from back east and worked in Hollywood and uh, they were really some pretty interesting characters. I think maybe working cowboys. Yeah, they were cowboys that had really been cowboys. They weren't just uh, dude wranglers for the most part. Then we had a lot of little uh, rodeos around where we'd have, uh, you know, competitions. We used to have horse races right down Indian Avenue. It was a dirt road in those days and we'd have horse races. Every once in a while somebody would match a horse with some other guy, some other stable, you know. And that's how the uh, the Desert Circus really got started out on um, the land. Uh, just as you turn the corner, you know, across from um, 
uh, Lyons English Grill. Mm -hmm. That's where we had the first Desert Circus in 1934. And uh, we made a little racetrack in there. I think the land belonged to Harriet Cody. And um, we had, uh, we made a nice little arena and, and uh, we had a braggers race that was uh, everybody in town bragging who had the fastest horse. So we called it the braggers race. Earl Kaufman had a horse and uh, uh, Pat Patterson had a horse in it and I had a horse in it. and. Uh, I think Pat Patterson won it. He had a pretty fast little horse. And uh, then we had a chariot race, which uh, I drove against Trav Rogers. I got four horses on these little chariots, and it was a pretty good race. I used to have a whip act in those days, so I could crack a whip and over the horses. And how did, how did the idea of Desert Circus come about? Come well, about? that was a kind of an interesting thing. And you keep hearing different stories about how the Desert Circus started, but it it, there was a gambling joint out here that Al Wertheimer had called the Dunes. It was out on what is now Date Palm, and a very high class, beautiful gambling place. And uh, they, uh, Al Wertheimer called all the people in town to get together to raise money for the Catholic Church, to build a Catholic Church on the reservation where the Our Lady of the Guadalupe is. Had a little bitty church, and they wanted to build them a bigger one. So, uh, he had uh, Father Lehane, who was a local priest, and Earl Streeby, and Earl Kaufman, and George Robeson, and Earl S and me, and Trav Rogers, I think, were all the people at that meeting. And we decided to put on a, uh, an event to raise funds for the, uh, for the church. And we charged admission to it, and uh, had several events, and it worked out pretty good so we put it on there for a couple of years and then uh, we got together a bunch of guys and bought the field club which was 40 acres on the corner of Sunrise and uh, Ramon which is now the Angel Stadium. It's called the Polo Grounds. For and we, well. well we called it the Polo Grounds because we had a polo ring and a polo field in the middle of a half mile racetrack mm -hmm. and we had a good uh, stand there uh, and you know a bleachers and all that sort of thing and a little house to entertain people and uh, we could put on a real we could put on a rodeo and have a racetrack around the mm -hmm. the half mile track and uh, it was a great thing we bought that because um, we wouldn't have had the park and all the things and the library and everything are all on that land mm -hmm. actually uh, it was all horsemen that bought it, and our agreement was that it had to be a horse-oriented uh, thing from then on out. And they, uh, in about 1950, we built the rodeo grounds, the new rodeo grounds, okay. and uh, then they tore that all down to move it out to, which is now the equestrian center, but it was really kind of a bad deal because all our horse people who put that in lost it to the angels in a park oh, I see. in the library. There, the Clarence Macy, in one of the interviews we've done for this project, uh, would talked about having rodeos up around Dry Falls. Uh, I don't well, know what years he was talking that about. That was real early was times. What happened was, I was in on that, I just happened to be down here, and we wanted to have a rodeo because we didn't have it. A Norman had a, Norman Farrah had a little, little grounds, but it was too little. So we decided to have a rodeo, and we went up to the, uh, we always called that the Indian Rodeo Grounds up there because it was on Indian land. And uh, somebody stole a grader that belonged to the uh, highway, the grading outfit. And we went up there and graded all night long. We filled it with gasoline a couple of times and graded a big level spot in there and built a rodeo grounds up on that flat, which is now covered with a dam in there, that big dam was there. For years, that was our uh, a good location for breakfast rides. We all went up in there. We had a good little rodeo, but that was about 1930 or 31, long in there. He said he said generally it was just uh, pretty informal, and that uh, everybody just sort of sat on the rocks up on the hillside itself. And uh, yeah, we didn't even have a fence around it. We just had it was like an open air rodeo, you know. And for bucking horses, we'd have to ear them down and saddle them out in the open and just let them buck wherever they'd go. I, uh, 
I, I, I think in conjunction with that, I, I certainly remember uh, your being master of ceremonies at so many of the rodeo events and certainly the, the kangaroo courts and all that. Uh, getting a little bit ahead here, but uh, how did you get into that role? How, I assume this goes well, back to the old Mirador days. Yeah, it did. I, um, I used to rodeo when, when, I'd, um, when I'd leave at the end of the season here for quite a while. I went to uh, rodeo. I had a whip act, and I'd do it like in Lancaster. I did a whip act and then in Fallon, Nevada, and Utah, and all over, and I'd get paid for my whip act and then I'd enter in the bronc riding and the bareback bronc riding and the bull riding. I couldn't rope good enough. I wasn't a very good roper so I never did any roping events but I did a lot of rodeo and and, uh, and I worked around a lot so then um, when Andy Oregi had a show one time and didn't have an announcer I announced his show and then for the next 20, 30 years I still announced rodeos every once in a while but uh, I've been announcing rodeos since about that period, you know. I just got entered by mistake. Well, I knew something about rodeos, having worked in them for a long time, and I knew all the guys in the show and everything, so I could announce the rodeo fairly well. With, with, with that much diversity, how did you fall into, so to speak, the, the, the El Mirador and an association with, with them? Well, the, um, when I was at, with Norman, had Norman Farrow's stable, mm -hmm. uh, there was a gal down here named June Travis that I was nuts in love with, and uh, sh her name was June Grabner. Her father was the manager of the White Sox, and she loaned me a Leica camera, and I learned how to be a photographer, and I was shooting pictures all over, and Warren Penny was looking for a publicity man. Tony Burke had been his publicity man the year before, and Tony went in the real estate business. It's about the mid-30s now? Yeah, this was in 1935. And uh, so I went up and took the job of being the publicity man for El Mirador, and I got a, uh, I got Warren to buy me a speed graphic, and I didn't really know anything about photography, but I learned pretty fast because when I'd take pictures and go into the Los Angeles Times or the Examiner or the Herald and show them pictures, they said, well, that's no good and that's no good, but they'd tell me how to, what they did want, and I finally got a flash gun and learned how to really be a publicity photographer to get pictures in motion instead of people just standing up looking at the camera like so many you see today you know it's kind of an opportunity really the idea that there yeah. were so many people that were were so world famous that came here well it was a it was easy to in those days what i did i took pictures of practically every guest at el Mirador because and i'd send them to their hometown papers because anybody who could afford to come to El Mirador was a big shot in his own hometown. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, there was a guy named Bull who was the head of uh, Cream of Wheat Company, lived in Minneapolis. And I sent his picture back to Minneapolis, and they had a great big picture in their Sunday section of him sitting by the pool, relaxing when everybody else is freezing to death in Minneapolis. And from that picture, we got about 20 more people from Minneapolis to come. And I sent, I did that always. I'd take pictures of everybody, and I'd always get them outdoors doing something, you know, and especially in shorts and, and uh, playing tennis or riding horses or playing golf or some sort of outdoor activity. And it was good publicity because everybody back there was uh, freezing to death and they're thinking, gee, look how nice it is if I was in Palm Springs. I, I Which remember, remember those, those breakfast rides that they used to have, Trav Rogers and all. Uh, were those out of the stables or were those sponsored by the hotels? Well, we had uh, the Desert Inn had their own breakfast rides, the El Mirador had their breakfast rides, Smoke Tree had their own breakfast rides, and uh, then in addition we had the Desert Riders every Tuesday. So we'd end up with a breakfast ride on Saturday for different hotels and and uh, then the desert riders. In those days you'd have uh, sometimes 300 people out on a breakfast ride. We used to take the, the two stage coaches we had at Rogers Stable. We'd take two stage coaches and um, um, all the um, people on horses plus a couple of wagons and haul an awful lot of people out to a breakfast ride. Did, there was a ride at one time that, uh, and, and I'm, I'm a little obscure about this, but I think it was Tony Burke or something sponsored something that went over to San Diego from here or? 
many years ago? No, Tony really, Tony went on the ride, but what we did, we started a ride, um, the Rancheros in Santa Barbara had started it was in 1930, and in 1938, I'd been on that ride, and uh, a lot of us knew about how to get a ride together. So Warren Penny and Earl Kaufman and uh, Trav Rogers and I started a ride we called the uh, Vaqueros del Desierto. And we started it here at the field club and we rode over to Keys Ranch, up through Thousand Palms over to Keys Ranch and round through Yucca Valley and came back over through Little Morongo and back into here. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the next year we had um, we went up through Mission Creek and up in there, Charlie Farrell went on that one and uh, had a lot of people, uh, well all, everybody in town went on it. Right. Uh, plus that we invited people from Los Angeles and we had about a hundred people. And uh, then the next year we had, uh, I've got movies of all this, I'll show them to you sometime. Uh, I, took, I took a movie of every ride from 38, 39, 40 and 41. And then we, the next year we went up through Palm Canyon and up to Pinion Flats and, and Bunkers Ranch and uh, we rode all the way around San Jacinto. We went into Idlewild and came out and came all the way around and over Bear Mountain and came down uh, by Cabazon and, and back home again. pictures of that in the old Villager magazine yeah. on one of those rides. Uh, the Desert Riders. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about the Desert Riders. That was mostly just local people. Well, the Desert Riders started in 1930. I guess it's the oldest club in town. And um, I was on the first Desert Riders, but I wasn't a member because I was a horse wrangler in those days. And, and uh, I wasn't, I was always on them, but uh, I wasn't a member. I didn't become a member until about 1938 or so. And. Uh, we had the first desert ride we had, we went way out Ramon and there was a kind of a little hill down in the gully there. It was kind of a pretty place early in the morning. And uh, Pat Patterson and Earl Kaufman and George Robeson and uh, all the local people. It was really mostly local people and then they'd bring guests. Anybody could bring a guest. And uh, it's continued until today. We've got 120 members, I guess, in the desert riders. and. Uh, We've built all the trails that you find, all these mountain trails all around here are built by the Desert Riders. They've done a great job. The Los Compadres, is that, where does that fit in? I well, know they're a reasonably old organization. Well, yeah, the Los Compadres is a, was a club started of just the working kids of the town. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know exactly when they started. It was, oh, after the war, I think about 1945 or I mean, 46, somewhere along in there. And uh, they they were a riding club too. It's gotten now, so there aren't very many riders in the club, but they're, in those days, they were all kids that had horses around town. Some people, going way back maybe. I, uh, I always, I remember a story you told me about Little Bear. Little Bear taught me to ride. Mm -hmm. uh, that stable's out in section 14. You were telling me a story about how she got that name and all, and I guess from up in well, Wrightwood area. I had the horses, uh, well I still, every summer I I went back to Wrightwood for years, but uh, there was an old cabin up there that uh, was an old log cabin, and, and it was the first ranger station up there belonged to a guy named Old Bear, and his wife was Little Bear, and when he died, she came down here. She was older than God when she came down here, but she still rode all the time, and and she always wore uh, boots like Tom Mix with high boots and uh, pants that fit in her boots. She was in the Desert Circus Parades for yeah. years. And uh, she taught all the kids in town. She, was, she worked at uh, a lot of stables. She worked for me for a while. My st every, every year she'd be at a different stable. You know? And she was good because she had a lot of kids that she'd take out riding and teach them to ride and stuff. We were and called Little Bear's Rangers, if yeah, I remember correctly. She, <laughs> she was... <clears throat> She'd always uh, tell them about how she punched cattle for old man Talmadge up on the mountain. She'd go up there every summer. And uh, she was a great little old gal, but uh, a little pushy kind of, you know. And uh, whenever we'd have the Desert Circus, why, she'd try to, to uh, lead the parade. And we'd always get some marshal or somebody that we'd, some movie star. 
but Little Bear would come down with the American flag. And you had to put the American flag in the lead of the parade. So uh, every year there she was with the American flag and she'd carry it and lead the parade. So finally it became a tradition. We never had a circus without Little Bear <laughs> leading the parade. An awful lot of people that were, I suppose, prominent in, in early Palm Springs and, and were certainly around during the years that when you came here, the, the McManuses and, and uh, all of that. Do you have recollections of them as far as uh, Annie Pearl? And well, sure, Andy Pearl became a very good friend of mine in Austin. He went on our rides, mm -hmm. her husband. And I, they used to, when I was, uh, had the stable, they used to invite me up to their house for dinner and we became pretty close friends. And I knew Pearl, of course, until she died. I, I got her to put up the money for the fountain out here, you know. And uh, I even managed the tennis club for her for a while. When she went to Europe one time, I took over all her kind of business here in town and uh, helped her with the tennis club. You could almost get a history of the tennis club would be an interesting story, starting out of who started it and how it came about, you know. The, uh, the other, you talk about interesting people, Lois Kellogg was one of our most interesting people down here that had the uh, house she built uh, uh, on Indian Avenue where the Safeway is now. Mm -hmm. And Lois was a real eccentric gal. And uh, she had a house that uh, was uh, started by um, a guy named Cody, who was Harriet Cody's husband. He was an architect. When he died, she just never finished the house. I think they had a kind of a romance going or something, but that old house set there, uh, Irma Schumann bought it when she died and uh, stayed there for years. It's before just a shell for a yeah, lot of years. It was just a shell of a thing. But she, was, uh, she had um, big uh, Russian wolfhounds and you used to see her walking around town with three or four big wolfhounds walking around. And when I had the stable, when I took over the stable from Norman Ferris, she had uh, four big old bulls out there in a corral and she used to come out every day and take care of her bulls and they used to knock the fence down and I had a hell of a time with them trying to keep them going and uh, she had a little horse that she kept there. Was there. This, this the house on Palm Canyon? No it was on Indian Avenue oh. between Indian Avenue and Palm Canyon she owned the whole thing but the the house was really the entrance was off of Indian. Was the Del Toquitz there then or was no. that just Yeah, blanked? the Del Toquitz was there. That was farther. She was right next door, right next almost, door yeah. to Del Toquitz, yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, when uh, Norman Farah, when he w was at the stable then and when he flipped his lid, uh, was Lois Kellogg and I that got him in the booby hatch because she was a pretty good friend of Norm's. But she was a very interesting gal and then moved from here. Uh, I've got the whole story in the villagers, so there's no use of telling you all about it. But uh, uh, when she left here, she went to um, Ely, Nevada. She had a ranch way out in Ely, Nevada. And when I was in the Navy, I was in Ely, Nevada one day and here comes Lois Kellogg walking in. And uh, her ranch was way f out of Ely. And uh, she finally died on her ranch up there and then nobody else, nobody knows what happened, but she had her 40 Russian wolfhounds. She's she went and built woman. a ranch just to raise her wolfhounds. She's a beautiful woman, I remember seeing pictures. Very, of her. very pretty woman. When, one time she, she imported a whole carload of Russian wolfhounds from back east from some stable or some kennel. And uh, when they got in Arizona, the guy with them opened the door to look out to see where he was and all the dogs jumped out the door and <laughs> ran all over the desert and it took her months gathering up her dogs out there. <laughs> they just took off and ran out in the prairie. We were talking about some of the more prominent people and certainly the the uh, the tennis club and the, the McManuses and all. It obviously comes to mind the, the Kaufmans and the Desert Inn and that whole area. Well, no matter what anybody says when you read history, you know, you read it from different angles, but uh, Mother Kaufman was really the person who started this town. And if it hadn't been for her, her husband, Dr. Kaufman, and you know, very little is ever said about Dr. Kaufman. He was a great guy that uh, came down here and started the Desert Inn as a tuberculous, tuberculosis sanitarium. And uh, he bought it from... Uh, another little old lady that had it 
in there before. I forgot her name. I've got her name in my thing on there. But uh, and you, and I've got the uh, um, his brochure. I'll show it to you. The, the brochure where he says and he he tells how uh, doctors recommend this for arthritis, uh, lumbago, and all different diseases. He never mentioned tuberculosis, but it was primarily a tuberculosis sanitarium. And after a few years, Mother Kaufman, she said, well, this is too nice a place to have a bunch of sick people. This ought to be a resort. And she and the doctor got in a battle about it, and finally he left because he wanted it to be a sanitarium and she wanted it to be a hotel. So uh, he left and went down Valley and started another sanitarium, and, and Mother Kaufman stayed and built up the Desert Inn and made it a hotel. And uh, she ran probably the the first five-star hotel around because the the food was excellent and everything they did there was first cabin and they had the finest people in the world. People would make reservations years in advance to get in the Desert Inn and it was really an A1 place and Mother Kaufman was the sweetest, nicest little old gal that ever lived and really was the biggest power in the town. If Mother Kaufman wanted something, I'll guarantee you it happened. And if she raised hell about something, why well, something was done about it. And uh, George Robeson, he ran the garage and Earl Kaufman kind of handled the hotel, but it was Mother Kaufman who was really the head of everything. And uh, one of the sweetest, nicest people that ever was, and everybody loved her, but when she got a little tough and wanted something done, boy, everybody listened. I remember in, in one of the interviews that we did, I think with Culver Nichols, we were, he was talking about sort of the big five and how P.T. Stevens had the north end and, and Nellie Kaufman had the center of town and, and, uh, and that. Was, was that true? Were they just sort of every area was, was sort of controlled, so to speak? Well, not really because uh, the Desert Inn was really the only thing you know, until 1927 when, when P.T. Stevens built the El Mirador. And the El Mirador became a kind of a different kind of a hotel than the Desert Inn. The Desert Inn was kind of the, the staid old people who had come for years, and, and El Mirador was a very glamorous place. And uh, when they went broke and Warren Penny, who was uh, the lawyer that came down to, to take it over for the bankruptcy, you might say, and Warren was a, an amazingly good hotel man for a lawyer. And he put in real fine chefs and high quality food and and it was a beautiful hotel, but they catered more to the uh, Hollywood crowd and uh, uh, a little different, more of a glamorous group. The Desert Inn was kind of the state old group that uh, liked the quiet and the peace and everything and Warren ran a little fancier hotel. And there was a lot of competition between uh, El Mirador and the Desert Inn. Although Warren and um, Earl Kaufman were the best of friends, you know. Th those were about the major hotels at that time, weren't they? They were the only those two hotels. Uh, <coughs> the, um, there was the Del Tokwitz, which was <coughs> belonged to a gal named Fritzy Ridgeway originally. And uh, then uh, Hope Garlic had the uh, <coughs> um, Oasis Hotel. And uh, the... Um, the El Mirador and the Desert Inn were just the four hotels. When, do, when did, uh, oh, I, I think of the nightclubs, the, the obviously attractions for the people once, once this place started appealing to the movie colony. Uh, I think of the Chichi. I don't know what well, years we're talking about. <clears throat> we didn't really have any nightclubs, you know, until the Chichi came. But there was a place called the Cane Breaks, and it was up on... Uh, it was on Culver Nichols' property. It was an old house. And the guy had a kind of a saloon there, and everybody would go to the cane breaks. It was on, um, oh, about Vista Chino and Caballeros, way up yonder. And it was, there was cane all over. Remember the cane breaks we used to have to stop the wind? That's why they called it the cane breaks. But that was our one nightclub. And then the doll house was way down. Uh, in the middle of town, uh, Arenas, uh, on Arenas, yeah, up toward the tennis club, and they had just a little kind of a shack thing there where you'd go in through a lot of palm leaves and kind of turn the corner, 
and uh, was this Streeby <coughs> when it was the no. ori original dollhouse? No, it was. Um, gosh, I can't even think of her name. Her husband was Don somebody. The Streebys bought it long after that, and uh, but they started it, and then they eventually bought the other place up on Palm Canyon. But the dollhouse was the place to go every night, you know, and they had great big nice steaks and those potatoes. Then when the Streebys took it over, it became even more glamorous because Ethel ran a very glamorous place. You know, she had a lot of pretty waitresses and those potatoes, and uh, there were kind of uh, pan-fried potatoes that stood up on end, you know, like hash browns and cinnamon rolls and the food was excellent. It was really a great place. The Chi Chi kind of brought in, in top name entertainment. For the first well, time. The, the Guadalajara trio started at the dollhouse. Lombardo Leva is still here in town, you know. He was, he's the only one left of the original Guadalajara trio. And they were so good that everybody went there every night to listen to them. And they were probably one of the best Mexican trios that ever happened, you know. They became, they worked in pictures and were famous all over the country. But they started really at the dollhouse. And Rene, uh, who now sings at the um, Cedar, Creek. Cedar Creek Inn, is, is Lamberto's son, you know. And he sings is better than his old man did. <laughs> Uh, going back and maybe being a little bit redundant, but needless to say, we, we all recognize your, your civic responsibilities over the year. I'd like to talk a little bit about maybe the, the beginnings of the Chamber of Commerce. I think you were kind of a Chamber of Commerce before there was a Chamber of Commerce. Well, in, in the early days, before the city was incorporated, the Chamber ran the town. And uh, we had a committee for the airport, and a committee for this, and a committee for that. and, and as, as near as there was any organization in town, the volunteer fire department, everything came under the chamber. Then after incorporation, there kind of was no chamber. So I started uh, a thing with uh, Fred Ingram and Barney Hinkle and uh, a lot of us got together. Before that, there'd been a thing they called the Palm Springs Associates, which was the four or five big hotels trying to promote the town all got together. And then I ran the chamber for quite a while, and, and I did it as a, a, it was just me and a secretary. And uh, I did all the advertising and publicity and everything for several years. For Were you the, still with the El Mirador at this time? Sort of adjunct to uh, publicity I did it, and finally I got so much to do that I had to leave the El Mirador. And I uh, did nothing but the publicity for the town. But I did all the... Uh, I, I used to take, I'd take 40 pictures a day. I'd take scenics and I'd, I'd call every hotel and see who they had in their hotel. Like uh, the Ingleside Inn, if they had somebody up there, why well, she'd call me and say, we've got uh, Harold Bell Wright or somebody up here and I'd run up and take it. And I, I was also a stringer for Life Magazine later and I took all the pictures, everything in this section that was taken for Life. In fact, uh, the first issue of Life, I had a picture in there of um, Governor Lehman swimming in the pool. <clears throat> then I had a picture of Governor Lehman and Shirley Temple that they used. It was in Tony Burke's book. You remember that picture of the Governor and Shirley? But um, I think in those days we got about, well, we depended on publicity because we didn't have a lot of money for advertising. But on the Los Angeles Times, um, Every Sunday about, we'd have a whole page of Palm Springs Society. And uh, the examiner always ran, at least once a month, a whole big layout on Palm Springs, what people were doing in Palm Springs. We got much more publicity than we've ever had since. Because, I don't know, the CVB doesn't put a lot of emphasis on publicity. I, I've always thought we ought to do a lot more of that because it doesn't cost you anything. Well, and the emphasis on the people that do come here. Exactly. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I, I even used to write a column for the uh, Los Angeles Examiner called Lady Verbena. Don't ever tell anybody that, but uh, a lot of people, nobody ever knew who wrote it because I was embarrassed to do it, but I couldn't find anybody to write it, so I had to write it myself. But it was a column on society in Palm Springs that they ran every Sunday in, in the Los Angeles Examiner. The, uh, the, the tennis club and the, um, the racket club, needless to say, were 
were very exclusive clubs at that time and brought an awful lot of people down here, specifically the, well, the, the racket uh, club. Charlie, Charlie Farrell's racket club, you have to give him credit for really adding an awful lot of glamour to Palm Springs because uh, it was a very exclusive club. Nobody could get into it. I've managed it for Charlie for two or three years. Well, up until the war started, I was managing the club. And uh, the, um, we didn't let anybody in unless they had a guest card. And even like Joe Skank came out one time and uh, he came to the front door and he said, uh, the secretary called me. So I went out and he said, I'm Joe Skink. And I said, I'm sorry, uh, I don't care if you're Jesus Christ. Have you got a, a guest card? And he said, no. And I said, you can't get in here. He was madder than a wet hen. And he said, he kept saying, I'm Joe Skink. And I said, I don't care. You can't get in the racket club. That's how tough it was. Yes. We made it tough to get in. But the, the parties we had at the racket club, on Friday night, I used to put on a, I call it amateur night. And I'd pick up a couple of entertainers to start with. And in the audience, we'd have Bob Hope and Phil Harris and Alice Fay and Freeman Gosden and Charlie Carell and uh, Bing Crosby. And we'd put on a show that everybody would get up and entertain because it was all their own people, you know. And we'd put on a show would cost you a million dollars. And then uh, we had Rudy Valley would come down every year and put on a whole show at the Racket Club. And uh, that got us a lot of national publicity, incidentally. Rudy was big in those days. And then Bob Hope used to put on his uh, um, radio, radio show, show, you know. In, in and you know, a lot could be said for uh, Amos and Andy, you know, was broadcast from El Mirador Tower. Freeman Gosden and Charlie Correll both lived here. And uh, uh, Charlie Correll had his own house, but Freeman and his wife lived at El Mirador. And we'd all go up every night uh, he'd write their their uh, story every afternoon, and every night they'd go up and broadcast it from El Mirador Tower, and that got international publicity for Palm Springs. I remember an awful lot of radio shows that emanated out of, of movie premier premieres at the uh, the old Plaza Theater. I guess it's about to go through its 50th anniversary, mm -hmm. and I keep remembering seeing uh, 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 George Burns and Gracie Allen radio shows and all, yep. and they would always have. Well, yeah, it was so easy to do a radio show, you know, television shows a little hard to do because you have all the production, but radio shows, we had lots of them down here at the Plaza Theater like that. Um, well, it put us, Palm Springs in the spotlight too Yeah, in those years, which I'm not sure that we, we draw that much anymore of that sort of thing, of major movie premieres mm -hmm. and that. I was looking over some old pictures. I used to take Gracie Allen out riding all the time. When, and. Uh, Jack Benny put on his show down here, too, and Jack was a great guy. He used to have all these uh, um, writers would come down, and they'd work all week, and then put on the show here. And uh, that brought tremendous publicity to Palm Springs. A lot of people forget uh, how important it was, all those people working here and uh, the glamour they put on Palm Springs. And, and every show they'd have, they'd always have something about, it would be set in Palm Springs, you know, like if they had a little play like or something, and Jack Benny would be talking about the chief of police and, and all that kind of stuff. It was a small stuff. enough town that yeah. everybody knew everybody, whether they were they, celebrities exactly. that came here to live or not. Then when Charlie Farrell became mayor, uh, which he was for about 12 years, we got tremendous action from that, and a lot of shows had come down there and they'd interviewed Charlie, you know, and, and uh, he was great for helping the town become famous, you know. One thing I, I need to ask here, just because it's kind of in conjunction with that, that Plaza Theater and all, was that during Desert Circus for many years there, they had a thing called the, uh, the Insanities. I'd, I'd be well, curious to know more about how that got started and, and what it was. Well, after a while, this, this is after the Desert Circus had been gone on quite a while and it grew to really be a very good uh, event. And Melba Bennett started the well, it started off by having a little show at the Kangaroo Court. We had a Kangaroo Court at the Desert Inn. And then Melba decided to do a real show. So we had a show. She had Ernie Flat help her and a lot of people from Hollywood. And uh, 
we put on a show at uh, the plaza oh, four or five years. You couldn't get in. There had to be two nights, and the tickets were hard to get because it filled up so quick. And uh, we made the tickets as high as $25 even for ringside seats. And uh, we had Bill Gargan and, and uh, all the local actors we could get in it, plus uh, a quartet of Johnny Seaman and um, um, a lot of the local guys like Harry Reid. And uh, I was always in it doing some silly thing. Johnny Boyle would sing, and, but it was really a very good show. I remember Jim Maynard dressed up as a woman, I think, doing a hula or something. Yeah, and uh, oh, Slim Martin, <clears throat> we had him one time. He, he had been a contortionist, did you know that before? And I, I'll never forget, we had him hanging on a trapeze with, his, with long uh, red drawers all tangled up in himself. <laughs> hanging up there for all through the entire show almost. But it was a great show and, and it was something we ought to really revive if we could do because it was all local people and, and uh, Ernie Flatt was a good director and he made a show. She had all the girls singing, he had a chorus, a dancing chorus and it was a peach of a show. It's real well done, real well done. Jim Maynard, name came up just a moment ago. You must have known Jim, didn't you? Jim was a uh, he was a real character, you know, and, and you could almost write a book about Jim. He was on the police force and he weighed 270 pounds or so. And uh, he was so strong and husky that uh, I remember one time he got drunk and there was some little guy trying to help him and he said, get out of my way. And he pushed the guy clear down the mountain, he broke his leg. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one time I was with Jim when he was, a, I used to ride around with him when he was a policeman and there was a, a Mexican and a black guy got in a fight and the, uh, in, in a little, there used to be a little bar on Arena there off of the road, it was a kind of a tough little bar and uh, they were out in the street fighting and we got a call so we went over there and uh, the, the little Mexican had a, uh, a knife that was one of those uh, linoleum knives and he was swinging it around in the black guy was defending himself with the cue, that thing you put the balls in, you know, the cue up the balls. And they were dueling like this. And Jim went up and just grabbed the back of both their heads and just smashed their heads together for about five minutes. They were all bloody. He said, if you want to fight, let's take it out this way. Yeah. He, he wasn't scared of anything, you know. Yeah. And he is, he is the guy that uh, when we started the tramway, uh, he was their guide that took him up and showed him where everything was. He used to hike up and down Chino Canyon and mark all the spots for him. He was awful responsible for an awful lot of rescues and all on the mountain. And all Always the rescuing somebody. He knew this mountain like a book. And he had a mine up there, you know, way up in Andres. We've got the old thing that over at the stable now where he used to, uh, he had a horse rigged up with a drag so he could drag the material up to that mine he had up in there. And uh, they still call it Maynard's Mine. And uh, the, um, the one thing about Jim, he was, he was closer to the Indians than anybody. All the Indians loved him. Auntie Flora used to, Flora Siva, you know, she used to, uh, he used to go and talk to her all the time and he told her all the stuff. And he knew all the uh, history of the tradition of the Indians long before anybody else did because they'd tell him things. And you know that picture that you see around of uh, Pedro Chino? It's a big picture. Well. I got Jim to get him up in Chino Canyon for our Desert Riders one time. That's when I took that picture. That was in about 1933. But Jim was the only guy that could talk to the Indians, and the Indians loved him. He got along great with them. And Jim took me to the ceremonies they had, the, uh, the ceremony they had for when people die, you know. It was a, they'd have a ceremony at the Little Indian Roundhouse, and uh, they had it every two years. and. Uh, it was to celebrate uh, all the deaths of all the people that there in the net who was the uh, old Potencio. After this thing went on all night long, it was a long ceremony, he would tell everybody now, go and don't mention these people anymore. And that's one reason today when you ask people who their father was or their grandfather, they don't know because they were told by the net who was the uh, ceremonial chief of the clan here to not ever mention those people anymore. I didn't realize for many years why uh, people wouldn't tell me who their grandfather was or their ancestors. They, they were told not to, you know. And uh, 
Mrs. Martinez is about the only one that I could get anything out because of enough time had left from the old ceremonies that she'll tell you now who everybody was. And is that Francisco Potencio? Yeah. He was kind of the spiritual mm -hmm. leader. He was, he was the spiritual. The most important one was what they called the net. Mm -hmm. And he was in charge of all the ceremonies in the little roundhouse he used to have down there. Mm -hmm. Just on section 14, there was a, all the Indians had a house like that. I forgot the name of it. There's a big long Indian name for it. But it was uh, very interesting. Uh, what they would do would, um, you'd, you'd sit there for hours and they had little fires around and uh, every once in a while some old guy would stand up with a little uh, stick in his hand and then he'd go, Arrgh! and I found out later he was getting rid of the evil spirits. He was chasing them all out with us. But the ceremony really didn't start till very late in the evening. And then the, the women, that were chosen women, would have little effigies about that big of all the people who had died. And uh, they would go out, nobody else was allowed to go out, but they would go out with the net and they'd take them out and burn all those effigies up. And then they came back in and uh, they'd have a, a sort of a ceremony where in the old days they used to give all the baskets out of all the people who had died, but <clears throat> by this time there weren't any baskets, so they'd give uh, bolts of cloth to, to make dresses out of them. They'd give cloth to all the different people in the ceremony. And, uh, but the interesting thing too, there was a, one guy had to do the singing, uh, Joe Potencio, was the only guy that knew all the songs and they had to sing a song that was the history of the entire uh, all the legend of uh, the Kawiya tribe and he would sing that song which take him 12 hours to sing and if he missed a word in it he had to go back and start all over again it was interesting because they couldn't write in the early days that uh, how Indians preserved it because it had to be exactly word for word the way it was written. I think the way it was he, he had somebody that would almost correct him as so well. He did. There were other people knew. Mm -hmm. The the net knew and uh, the uh, they had another guy who was the uh, sort of the under him, the the vice president you might say. And uh, old Pedro Chino was the uh, Puvalum, which was the medicine chief and he knew all the songs. So if any, if this guy would make a mistake, they had to go back and do the whole thing over again. But it's the way history was written so that everybody had it exactly the same year after year after year, and they had to learn it exactly. And that's the story of um, Mukat that came over the mountain and flew down to the little hill and, and uh, named all the places in the valley and told where the Panikum clan would be and the Kawistam was the one down here. and the one that went over to uh, Thousand Palms and he laid out while he was on that little hill up there in front of Andrews, he laid out the whole valley of where every clan would go. And it was all in that song. Frank, you were, uh, you were talking about the Indians and I, I remember earlier wanting to talk a little bit more about Trav Rogers. Why don't you, why don't you tell us more about him? Well, actually, uh, people are going to forget Trav Rogers. He was really one of the greatest guys we ever had down here. And Trav wasn't just an ordinary cowboy or stable guy. He'd been a very wealthy man over in San Diego, and he was in the rock and sand business over there, and uh, gravel and all that sort of thing. And uh, he had uh, several trucks and, and went flat broke. And he had a little dude ranch up by, uh, way up in the mountains above in San Diego County. And when he went broke, he came over here with seven horses leading them and came into town to start a stable and he got together with some gal who helped finance him and they built a little stable on the on the ranch there and then when Norman went broke he built the he took over the he leased it from Zaddy Bunker and took over that stable on Chiva. then eventually he went up and bought a piece of land from um, um, Culver Nichols and built the the ranch club and he had a rodeo ground out in front, and uh, he made almost this, a duplicate of the same ranch club that we had before on Tachiba. And <clears throat> then we started uh, 
I managed it for him for, uh, well, it was about 1940, I think. When I first got married, I, was, I managed this thing for him. And we had, uh, we served uh, food and I had a little dining room. We called it the Mink and Manure Club. And uh, we served steaks and beans and apple pie and we had a, a bar and we'd have square dances and stuff. And this became the most popular nightclub in town. And the reason they called it the Mink and Manure Club because all the cowboys in town would be over there square dancing. And all the people from El Mirador, Desert Inn, and all the high class society people and movie stars and everything would come there every night. It was a crowded place every night. And we had uh, Buster Bill and Joe were a trio singing cowboy songs and dancing and stuff. And then we had a, a room upstairs that finally added on to it that uh, where you could have big enough to have square dances. And uh, Trav would call the square dances and, and uh, round dances and and he was a great host. You know, he everybody loved Trav and, and uh, he became a very important guy in this town. He got into the desert circus and helped with everything, helped put on the rodeo. Trav and I put on the rodeo for several years before we turned it over to the mounted police. But we put on the rodeo all by ourselves. And he was he was a big leader in the town and just died a few years ago. But it's I, I keep thinking what a what a great addition he was to the town and people are gonna forget all about those kind of people. You know, there's a lot of great people in this town like like Tom Lips was the guy that owned he bought the uh, Del Tocquitz Hotel from um, Fritzy Ridgeway, who was a kind of a crazy gal. And uh, Tom became a very strong force in this town. Uh, he was a, a lawyer and he was a sort of a devil's advocate. If Warren Penny and uh, Earl Kaufman were for it, he was against it. And he fought all kinds of things in this town, you know. But, and and uh, was a good level, uh, a guy to level out things kind of because he was always a, a devil's advocate on everything. And uh, there's a lot of people like that that people are going to forget because nobody remembers who he was. Tom was the guy that, um, it was kind of interesting, his wife Billy Lips was a very popular gal in this town. She'd been one of the Sean dancers who were a famous dancing group in the early days. And um, Billy had a dog that died and she wanted me to bury her dog and they owned some land up here at Two Bunch Palms. So I went out to dig a trench with Billy to dig a hole to bury the dog and when I dug down about three feet I hit hot water and uh, water just came bubbling out and I couldn't bury the dog there because the water just was coming out of the ground. So Tom got all excited and he went over and developed that uh, place at Two Bunch Palms. Okay. Uh, interesting thing, the uh, you keep reading the paper how it was Al Capone's place and uh, I checked on that and Al Capone was in Joliet in jail at the time Tom was building that thing. So he had nothing, never came here, and never was here. And the guy that's got the place now is bragging about uh, Al Capone. The I Rock House, I think yeah, they call it. Yeah. Yeah. But it was all Tom Lips that built that over there. And he spent the rest of his life building that thing over there. And he always thought he was going to have gambling. So he built a beautiful kind of a resort place thinking he was going to have get gambling over there. And he never did get it. There's uh, coming coming up kind of current. There's uh, and certainly this this study recognizes that the, the fact that we're have a cutoff date kind of, of of history in Palm Springs. Just as of the the Second World War, there was a there was an amazing change that came about in this town with the Second World War, and uh, I assume the the texture of the town changed. Servicemen came here, uh, a transient population. It became more of a of a city than it was before when it was a small village. Any any thoughts? Well, I was gone all during the war. I was in the Navy and, and uh, the uh, what happened was uh, the uh, stick section 14. There was uh, one colored family, the guy that uh, was the shoe shine guy and, and uh, handled the laundry at the Desert Inn had a house there and there were a few other little shacks there, you know that were some Mexican families had built. And uh, when I came back, s Section 14 was just loaded with houses, just all kinds of little shacks that people had built all over. 
uh, they'd make a deal with the Indians of uh, paying them a small fee of ten dollars a month or something to build a shack but uh, there were a whole new bunch of people in town that had come that people had brought in because they couldn't get labor and they would brought them in during the war and uh, Lawrence Crosley had a had a piece of land over that the, right next to the stable on Ramon and he was the black guy in town and all the black people lived in that section and uh, he traded a piece of land from Addie Pearl out by uh, the municipal golf course and they started that section out there made a subdivision because they moved them all all the black people moved out of there and then during the war the whole right after the war all the black people kind of came to town and they moved into section 14 because there wasn't any place else and there were five or six families living in one house so that's when we had when I was the mayor years ago we had that big thing about moving all those people out you could almost write a book about that because that was a real battle you know and uh, then they finally moved up to the north end that's how come they are all up there now well, the Indians by that time had had a greater well, degree of control of their land. Yeah, and they, were, they weren't getting any money out of all these shacks that were all over mm -hmm. Section 14. I was always scared that, that uh, say, Life magazine would come in and see this dire poverty you had just a hundred yards from mm -hmm. the exclusive Desert Inn, you know. Somebody could have made an awful bad thing about Palm Springs, so we were very anxious to clear that up. And that was when I was a mayor in 1958 that we did finally clear that whole thing up and get all those shacks and plow them down off of Section 14. But it was a ghetto of uh, the worst poverty you ever saw with overhead sewers and and uh, one, one meter would go from house to house to house to house. Everybody was using the same meter, stealing electricity off of it. I know this is a little contemporary, but I'd like to get it in just because I'd like to, to know more about it is that uh, you were obviously one of the, the prime developers behind Thunderbird Country Club, which was certainly one of the first country clubs down here, and uh, there weren't even that many mm -hmm. golf courses at that well, time. When, actually, we had the O'Donnell Golf Course was only a, an eight, I mean a nine-hole golf course, and Floyd Odlum had a golf course. But that was all there was in the desert. And uh, what happened was, when I was in the Navy, I kept thinking, what do I want to do when I get out? And I always wanted to have a dude ranch. and. Uh, so I got uh, a group of people at the Menlo Circus Club that I used to manage every summer up there. I got them to put up the money and I bought uh, Section 11, which was out on the highway there. I bought it from Ray Cree for $34,000. And uh, I started the Dude Ranch, which we built down on the flat. And we called it Thunderbird Ranch. And uh, that was in 1947 when I opened and I. Melba Bennett and Frank Bennett from the Deepwell Ranch helped me a lot, you know, to tell me how to run it and everything. And <clears throat> we had a very good little dude ranch. I mean, we had a stable and uh, nice rooms and it was a big swimming pool and everything. And uh, then in uh, <clears throat> about 1949, I went back to see John Bull as in uh, Minneapolis. He was the guy I was telling you was the head of the cream of wheat company. And I, and I went all over the country trying to promote my dude ranch. And every place I'd go, people would say, well, if you only had a golf course, an 18-hole golf course, they all say, well, we go to San Marcos down by Phoenix because they got an 18-hole golf course. So I came home determined to get a golf course in Thunderbird. And I got a hold of everybody at the O'Donnell course, and they said, oh, no, you can't do it. You can't grow grass in the summertime and the winter time and you can't do it and uh, I finally got a hold of Johnny Dawson and uh, Johnny was working with uh, a group to build a golf course over at uh, Dr. Lerman's property which is over on the other side of the highway and it's kind of interesting that they were all over there they were all set to buy that and they had a group all ready to go because it was a beautiful location over there. All the, the palm trees going up, wasn't? It? Well, it was right on Avenue 20, and all those palm trees are in there, and it's it's on the San Andreas fault line, so there's a kind of a green spot in there, and there was about a thousand acres over there. It'd be a beautiful spot for a golf course, and they were all in a car, and they went to come back, and the wind started blowing, 
And when they got to Indian Avenue, there was no bridges in those days, and there was a train there. Stopped and because he used to pick up cars and stuff in there. And there was a big old freight train there that was there for over 40 minutes. And that blew the deal. They said, my God, if you want to come home from a golf game and get caught with that train, you never could do it. So I got a hold of Johnny the next day, and uh, we went together. He and I and Barney Hinkle got together to talk about taking this over and making a golf course up. So we made a deal to buy it from my corporation, which was the Thunderbird Corporation, made of all these people in, in uh, San Francisco. And we bought the, the whole section and uh, got Lawrence Hughes to be the golf architect. We had no idea how we were going to get money from because I put up a little money, Barney put up $9,000, I had about $4,000 and Johnny had a little money. But we got, uh, <clears throat> we started a thing there to raise money for it. And uh, Johnny went up to Washington to get all the people up in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, I went down to see Reuben Fleet and Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. And finally we got each one of those people to come in for $5,000. And we were trying to get uh, about 150 of them at $5,000 and we made a, a corporation out of it. And uh, the, f the first one to come in was Reuben Fleet who owned Consolidated Airlines. I spent the whole day talking to him to coming in. And then we got George Cameron and uh, J. Ross Clark and uh, then Johnny got, he had a hard time. He was up, it was a funny thing, he was up in um, Seattle and uh, he couldn't sell this deal. So he uh, made a deal where he'd give them a lot at Thunderbird. For 7000 they could get a lot and a membership, a $5,000 unit was part of the club. And he called me up and I said, Johnny, for God's sakes, the lots cost us $3,000 to put in. You know, not counting the land, you know, put in the pavement and the water and the electricity. And so a lot of those guys got a heck of a good deal. I remember ads in the old villager that that were advertising exclusive homes on uh, on the fairways for twenty one thousand. Yeah, right along in there. Well, then then we developed uh, the uh, we were the first golf course to put homes on the fairways because uh, we had to do it to get money. So we made it with lots all around all the fairways. We only got uh, eighty lots out of the whole thing. And Milt Hicks and Phil Harris were the, some of the two first people to buy and build. Then Paul Prom came in and built a house. And um, Hoagie Carmichael was in there for years too. Wasn't well, he? no, Hoagie never did. Mm -hmm. He was the tightest little guy in the world. I never could get him to buy a lot. He was a member, but he finally did buy a lot. And um, then Leonard Firestone bought two lots, and Barney Hinkle bought a lot because he had a wealthy wife. You remember, and. Um, um, then I got the Desi and Lucy were real close friends of mine, and I I got them to buy a lot, and it, but we had a big struggle getting that thing going at five thousand a piece. And the guy that really saved us was D. B. McDaniel's, was a guy from Texas. He came up and bought twenty lots, and put up another forty thousand dollars, and then uh, uh, Ross Clark he came in with some more money. But it was really a struggle getting that thing in. And uh, I keep hearing the history of Thunderbird, and every time you read it, it's different, but that's the true facts right there. If you read um, uh, Ed Ainsworth in his book, uh, Beckoning Deserts, he tells the history of Thunderbird. He never talked to me, and he never talked to Johnny Dawson. It's all wrong. It isn't anything like it was. Hmm? And then uh, Tony Burke got into the picture, cause, but Tony never really did anything out there except uh, he was, I wasn't a real estate broker, so Tony became the real estate broker and, and uh, sold the lots. You've, uh, you've done so many things over the years, we could, we could go on with this forever. I, uh, I think maybe this is a good place to stop because we've gotten past the war years. And uh, again, we could go back and talk about so many other things and, and you've been so active certainly as mayor and all over the last years. Hopefully we can just continue this dialogue and, and maybe pick it up at, uh, at another time.
I thank you very much for both myself and, and the Palm Springs Public Library. Thank you.